Hi everyone, my name is Shankar Nath and welcome to the ET Money Debt Mutual Fund video series. In this collection of videos, we shall present different aspects of debt fund investing in a style that you're now used to, with a lot of data, insights and suggestions, which we are certain will help you improve your investing decisions. In this first of many videos, we shall lay the foundation as we seek to have a better understanding of what is a bond, how are bonds priced, what are the different types of debt mutual funds, and more importantly, how to look at these different debt funds on the basis of their investment objective, investment strategy, credit risk, interest rate risk, fund performance, and other important variables. Or ha, agar aap is video ko Hindi mein samajna prefer karte hain, to CC button daba ke Hindi subtitles ko zaroor on kare. Let's get started. Let's start from the very beginning. What is a bond? A bond is nothing but a loan. So who needs a loan? A number of institutions borrow money to support their financing needs. These include the central government, the state government, banks, NBFCs, infrastructure finance companies, home loan providers, and of course, regular corporates. Okay, so how does this work? Let's simplify this a bit. Say a company, company X, needs a loan of a thousand rupees, and you would like to lend them the thousand rupees. To equip the transaction, company X issues a bond, thereby becoming the bond issuer and sets the following terms. The principal is a thousand rupees, the terms or maturity of the bond is three years, and the coupon is set at 7% annually, which comes to 70 rupees per year until the maturity of the bond. Now you find this a fair deal and you invest, do up the paperwork and become the bond holder. Now there are a few things you need to know here. Firstly, what the bond issuer is offering is merely a promise. A promise that he will pay you a coupon of 70 rupees for all three years and of course return back the premium of a thousand rupees. A promise means there is no 100% guarantee here, which means there is definitely some risk on account of the bond issuer not having enough money to pay some or the entire amount. This is what we refer to as the credit risk. Now the quantum of credit risk depends from company to company. Some companies have very strong revenue, cash flows and profits, which means they can service their debt obligations easily. These companies are given the highest rating by credit rating agencies like Crystal, Care and ICRA and are displayed as AAA or A1+. On the opposite end of the stick are companies which have shaky financials and consequently their bonds carry a higher level of credit risk. These papers are represented by descending alphabets and numeric signs like double B or B minus or D rated instruments. A second area of consideration relates to the trading in bonds. Unlike a loan that you take from a bank, bonds have a thriving exchange markets where debt instruments are bought and sold between parties. In fact, the global bond markets are currently over $100 trillion, which is more than twice the size of the global equity markets. The trading in bonds is often done with the objective of profiting from the bond's capital appreciation, that is any increase in the value or the price of the bond. But before we get to an understanding of how or why the price of the bond increases, let's first understand how bond prices are calculated in the first place. In theory, the current price for bond is simply the summation of its future cash flows discounted back to its present value. And there are just two steps to calculating this. Step one, we pen down all bond payments that are yet to be received, which includes the interest payments and of course the principal. And then we have step two, wherein we calculate the present value of these cash flows and sum up the numbers. Let's apply this to our 1000 rupee bond that gives us a 7% coupon. So say today is the 1st of January 2021 and you need to know the price of a bond that is going to pay us 70 rupees in year one, 70 rupees in year two, and 1070 rupees in year three. We now focus on the 1st of January 2022 entry. The receivable amount is 70 rupees. However, since we get that after one year, we discount it with an interest rate, say 7%. So this becomes 70 divided by 1.07, which comes to 65.5. Once we do the same calculations for year two and year three, we arrive at today's price of the bond, that is a thousand rupees. Do notice that we have used an interest rate of 7%. Now we could have used any other number, but we went for 7% because that's the discount rate that makes the present value of all the bonds cash flows equal to its price of 1000 rupees. 
this interest rate or discount is more commonly referred to as the bond's yield to maturity or YTM. It's a term that you'll hear and see very often when it comes to debt funds and will be covered in more details in video 2 of our debt fund series. Okay, now that we have some idea of bond pricing, let's extend our example to a more practical scenario. Assume today is 1st of July 2022 and the RBI governor has just announced a reduction in interest rates of say 4%. This means any new bonds that are issued from today onwards are likely to carry a lower coupon rate which effectively makes a 7% interest carrying bond more valuable to an investor. So in our example, since we are in July of 2022, there are three payouts that are still remaining on our bond. There is the 70 rupee interest payout that's due in six months. And then there are two payouts of 70 rupees and a thousand rupees that are due in another one and a half years. When we apply the steps on this information, we see that the fair value of our 7% coupon bond at a YTM of 4% comes to 1077 rupees. Which means today, if someone offers you an amount higher than 1077 rupees, you have a very strong incentive for selling that bond and making profits from that transaction. It's this interplay between interest rates, bond prices, credit risks, etc., that investors and fund managers are constantly trying to master through experience and learning. And speaking about learning, if you are keen to build upon your knowledge about investing and mutual funds, then do subscribe to the ET Money YouTube channel and do tap on that bell icon for notification alerts. In 2018, SEBI or the Securities and Exchange Board of India categorized debt mutual funds into 16 categories. These 16 categories carried a fairly clear definition of the scheme's characteristics in terms of the debt instruments they can invest into. But investing in debt mutual funds have a lot more factors to consider which shall be the focus of our study for the remainder of this video. With that being said, let's start with the first area that needs our consideration and that is the investment objectives. An investment objective is simply the goal or reason for which one invests in a debt fund. Most mutual fund companies would show an investment chart a lot like what you can see on the screen right now. This chart does make sense to an extent especially on the application of overnight, liquid, ultra short term, low duration and money market funds. These funds carry a higher level of predictability in returns and high safety of capital which makes them perfect for short term parking of money and cash management activities by corporates. Now let's shift our attention to the other end of the chart, especially to the medium to long duration, gilt and long duration category. Specifically from a returns perspective, do notice the roller coaster ride that these categories have gone through over the past 10 years. In fact, the data here shows that a 10% plus year is often followed by a low single digit year as we saw in 2010, 2013, 2015 and 2017 and is very likely going to be the scenario in 2021 itself. Now the objective of investing in debt is very different from equities. Equities are for wealth appreciation while the primary objective of debt is and should always be the protection of capital. And it's probably why our research team feels that the investment objectives chart we saw earlier is not the right way to invest in debt mutual funds. Instead, we feel investors who prefer debt for long term investing will be better served when looking at it as a series of shorter periods of three to four years rather than one big chunk of 10 to 15 years. This approach of breaking your investment horizon to smaller chunks offers two big advantages. One, it gives greater protection of capital by regulating the risk one takes. And secondly, the flexibility offered by this approach allows you to take better advantage of capital appreciation opportunities. The understanding of this will get better as we move along to other sections of this video series. Debt funds primarily follow either of these two strategies to generate returns, an accrual strategy or a duration strategy. An accrual strategy aims to generate steady returns by investing in bonds and holding it till maturity. This means the concept of an accrual strategy is centered on receiving interest income from the bonds it invests in. These papers are then usually held till maturity, which means the interest rate risk is on the lower side. Liquid funds, ultra short term bonds, low duration, money market funds, and even the corporate bond funds primarily follow the accrual strategy. 
Outside of mutual funds, institutions that use the accrual strategy include pension funds and insurance companies that have longer term commitments and invest over very long durations, often running into decades. Net-net, the accrual-based strategy is perfect for investors who require a constant return from the debt portfolio and are not keen on taking higher risks. Now let's look at the duration strategy. A fund that follows a duration strategy aims to generate returns by actively managing the portfolio duration. The phrase actively managing the portfolio duration means that money is made by predicting interest rate movements and in the active buying and selling of securities. The strategy is employed by long duration dynamic bonds and guilt funds as they aim to sell bonds at a profit. A profit situation generally arises when interest rates fall as a drop in interest rates pushes up the price of bonds as we discussed in an example earlier in this video. Having said this, do note that duration strategy funds are open to interest rate risks, which means these funds take losses if the interest rates start inching upwards rather than going down. For example, presently a number of debt fund managers are expecting an increase in interest rates, which is pushing down the price of bonds and the NAVs of most long duration funds are down by 2-3%. to in such times where interest rates are expected to go up, funds following the duration strategy control the portfolio's duration by opting for shorter duration funds. Of course, it won't be right to presume that a fund or the fund manager follows only one of these two strategies at all times. In fact, most funds use a blend of both the accrual strategy and the duration strategy to improve their chances of maximizing investor returns. The Reserve Bank of India uses the benchmark policy rate or the repo rate to regulate the supply of money in the financial system. This intervention is done to achieve multiple objectives like stabilizing asset prices, improving our balance of payment situation and of course to boost economic growth. Since these objectives are constantly changing, interest rates are always in a state of flux. To put flux in numbers, in the last 15 years, the Reserve Bank of India has changed the repo rate some 50 times. Now we've already established that the price of the bond has an inverse relationship with the interest rates. So when the interest rates fall, the price of the existing bonds increase and vice versa. That's rule number one and forms one of the most important rules of bond pricing. A second rule one should understand is the relationship between a bond's maturity and the risk of interest rate changes. Here as a thumb rule, longer the tenure of the bond, the more sensitive it is to interest rate changes which means debt funds like long duration or guilt funds will be more sensitive to interest rate changes as compared to short duration funds like liquid or money market funds. In fact, let's examine both these rules with some actual data. In the table you see now, we have populated the returns of a liquid fund, a money market fund, a guilt fund and a long duration fund across different time periods. Do notice the relatively low returns volatility in liquid and money market funds across these 15 years. More specifically, let's look at the performance of the GILT and the long duration fund in the periods when the interest rates were in a downward trajectory. Notice here that these funds performed exceedingly well in this period as the bond prices continued to increase as interest rates kept falling. And on the opposite end were periods of rising interest rates which led to low and even negative returns in some years. For investors and fund managers, the understanding of the interest rate cycle is quite important and can have a big bearing on what kinds of debt funds one should be investing in. So if we connect this learning with the section on investment objective, it kind of draws down the point that when interest rates start falling, it makes better sense to opt for longer maturity bonds so as to profit from the appreciation in bond prices. And when the interest rates are likely to rise, which seems to be the case now, it seems more prudent to go for shorter maturity bonds. Just like individuals are given a credit score, institutions receive a credit rating. What's a credit rating? It's simply an opinion by a credit rating agency regarding the ability and willingness of an entity to repay the principal and interest on the loan it has taken. This opinion is based on multiple factors which are evaluated by the rating agency and include consideration variables like the continuity of the business, the cash flows, the accounting quality, past debt servicing history, etc. And on this basis, a score like AAA or AA or BBB is assigned to the bond issuer. There are a few things one needs to understand here. 
Firstly, it is commonly understood that bonds issued by the government don't carry any credit risk. This is true to a large extent, which is why gilt funds are often labeled as funds with low credit risk. But having said this, do note that it's not just the gilt category, but most debt fund categories have a choice of investing in government bonds and many funds do exercise this option. A second point one needs to understand is that more often than not, higher the credit rating, lower is the coupon rate offered by the issuer and vice versa. Which means you are likely to find higher coupon rates only in papers where the credit rating is low or moderate. As an example, let's examine the portfolio of the Nippon India Credit Risk Fund. The December 2019 top holdings show that the fund has invested in many corporate papers which are rated as double A or lower. Of course, these low to mid quality papers do carry a higher coupon rate as compared to triple A funds, thereby representing an option for the aggressive debt fund investor. Having said this, the fund also carries a higher level of risk which might show up in the form of delays in coupon payments and even defaults on the part of the bond issuer which can have a negative effect on the funds anyway. By now you would have realized that performance or returns in a debt fund comprises of many internal and external factors. Internal factors include the type of instruments in the portfolio, the maturity of the bonds, the portfolio duration, the investing strategy, etc. And then there are the external factors like interest rates and credit rating which do play a big part in determining returns. In terms of assessing the performance of debt funds, perhaps a good starting point is to map out how different types of debt mutual funds have performed over the past 11 years. Firstly, from an average returns perspective, we see that debt mutual funds have sort of delivered an annualized return of 8% give or take 1%. In fact, with the exception of overnight funds, all debt mutual fund categories have averaged and ranged between 7 and 9% in these last 11 years. A second point to consider here are the variations in returns. Again, a simple way to view this is by examining the difference between the maximum and minimum annual returns of a category over a number of years. The data here shows that, and especially in the case of medium duration, long duration and gilt funds, the movement of interest rates have had a big bearing on the annual returns. This big variation in the min and max returns strongly supports a suggestion that one might be better off in creating a debt investing strategy as a series of shorter periods rather than one long term investment. A third consideration when it comes to analyzing the performance of debt funds is the volatility in fund returns. Often we choose a fund solely on the basis of the returns it has generated in the past. This approach can lead to serious loss of capital as some of the data we have shown in this video earlier indicates that the long duration debt funds follow a meandering performance path rather than a steady one. In fact, one good way to understanding volatility can be the use of standard deviation. The data here shows the standard deviation of different debt fund categories around their 11 year average. Note here that the floater funds and the banking and PSU debt funds have a standard deviation quite in line with the shorter duration funds, which is particularly interesting and warrants for some further examination, which we'll cover in future videos. I think by now you would have got enough clues that there is a lot more to debt fund investing than a cursory glance at the performance, expense ratio and other peripheral factors. In addition to what we have discussed so far, it is important for all of us to understand that debt funds cannot be treated as a buy it and forget it instrument. There are many factors at play and it becomes all the more important to go deeper and understand specific debt related terminologies like yield to maturity, modified duration, average maturity, concentration risk and many more. We'll certainly be covering these terms in future episodes of this video series. I hope you like the content of this video and will draw many learnings from the information, data and insights presented. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share this video with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for watching and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.